Our scripture passage this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to be reading from chapter 4, and I'll be reading uh, verses 14 to 19. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me. To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. God, we pray that you would give us wisdom as we look at this passage and as we continue to try to understand what it is that Jesus wants from us as his followers. We ask that you would guide us through this time, that your Holy Spirit would open our minds and our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever watched a documentary or perhaps a a movie based on a historical situation. And as you're watching what's going on, the story that is being portrayed before you, that you find yourself in your mind or perhaps even out loud saying, that's just not fair. You're looking at the treatment of a a certain group of people and it is just wrong. And you just feel this sense within you that This is not the way it is supposed to be. There are so many stories that trigger this kind of response in our minds where we recognize that things are not the way they are supposed to be. Have you ever heard of Catherine Switzer? Has anyone here ever heard of Catherine Switzer? You might not have. Here is a picture of her as the first woman who was running the Boston Marathon in 1967. And you'll see that there's a lot of activity around her because the manager of the race is trying to physically stop her and rip off the uh, number from uh, her uh, uh, from her person. And uh, he ends up uh, actually assaulting her uh, during this attempt. Uh, One of the other people that's in there is actually her boyfriend who ends up knocking the manager down to the ground. And uh, Catherine Switzer does end up finishing the race, the first woman to run the Boston Marathon. Immediately after that, they uh, made a motion to not allow women to uh, run. But that has since changed, and I looked it up, and in the uh, most recent Boston Marathon, uh, just under half of the runners were women, and 95% of women finished, 97% of men finished, and it is very close. But we look at this, and we see this prejudice that this person had. This person was outraged that a woman would dare think that she could run the Boston Marathon with all of the other male runners. And I am thankful that she had the courage to do that. A story that might be a bit more familiar because of the the local tie is the number two construction battalion. And during World War I, there was a severe lack of manpower as uh, soldiers were fighting in the trenches And thousands and thousands were dying each day. And each nation who were uh, involved were desperate to find men who were willing to fight. And there were many men in Canada who were willing to fight, including black men. 
but they were informed by their government that their services were not required, or at least they were not welcome. Uh, they were deemed uh, unfit to fight because of the color of their skin. Eventually, uh, the government realized that the shortage was getting so severe that something had to do had to be done, and they would need to even tap into the uh, the black population. And so they ended up uh, creating a battalion, but they decided that these black soldiers would not be allowed to fight. Uh, they would have to remain uh, doing construction work to free up white soldiers so that they could fight. And uh, we recognize this because they had their headquarters in Truro and even just recently uh, the prime minister had come and apologized for what had taken place. Uh, interesting of that battalion, uh, there were uh, 595 men in the battalion plus 19 officers. And of those 19 officers, 18 out of the 19 were white. And the only black officer in the number two construction battalion was uh, Captain William Andrew White, who was the chaplain for that unit, uh, a Baptist chaplain, I will add. We see these stories and we recognize this is not right. It's not the way things are, are supposed to be. We see that uh, there are groups of people who are suffering and we, we acknowledge that suffering is going to happen to, to all people. We, we know that, that there are always going to be bad things. No one's going to have a perfect life. But we recognize that there are certain things that happen to certain groups of people uh, not because of their own actions and not even because of just the, the randomness of life, but rather because of prejudice over a certain group. And there are all kinds of, of, uh, of these things that have happened. And this feeling that we get when we hear these stories and we think that that's not fair, that is the longing for justice that is within us. We recognize that the world around us is unjust and there's a certain amount of outrage that is naturally within us. Now you might ask, if we naturally long for justice, why then is there so much injustice in the world? Well, a part of that is because those uh, who might see the injustice but are not necessarily suffering from it and, in fact, might actually be benefiting from it are not motivated to do anything about it. Um, uh, last year, we watched the, uh, the movie Amazing Grace that looked at the end of the slave trade. And one of the reasons that it was so difficult for England to ban the slave trade was not because of widespread approval of the slave trade. By that time, uh, the time of Wilberforce, people were recognizing that it was immoral, but they also recognized that if they removed the slave trade, the cost of everything would increase and they weren't sure they were willing to pay that price. They would say, yeah, it is terrible this is happening, but at this moment, we are benefiting from it and we're not quite ready to give up those benefits. And we can be critical of that, and yet something similar happens today. If you do a search for uh, ethical clothing brands, you will find that many of the brands of clothes that we wear every day, including I have recognized them here, and, and I, I know that I've worn them as well, that these clothing brands use slave labor in other countries, uh, that they are extremely dangerous working conditions, and uh, often the slave labor is actually child labor that is going on to, to, uh, to create the clothes that we wear every day. Well, why don't we just stop it? Well, one of the reasons why we don't just stop it is because uh, a lot of people, they'll look at that and say, yeah, that is really bad. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that that happens, but I'm not sure I want to pay five times the price what I'm paying right now just for things to be done ethically. And uh, that is, that's a struggle that people, uh, people face. 
Do we want things done ethically? Yes. Do we want to pay the financial cost? Well, that's another conversation for people to have. Now, what does this have to do for us as followers of Jesus? Well, in the passage that we're looking at, uh, Jesus is at the beginning of his ministry, and he's going to the synagogue, and he is handed a scroll from the prophet Isaiah, and he reads this scroll. And the scroll that he, the, the passage that he reads is one that deals with justice. It's something that was very much on the mind of Isaiah. And if you go through Isaiah, you'll see that that is a major theme of that prophet. He recognized that a lot of the suffering that was going on with Israel is because of the injustice that they were not only tolerating, but that they were promoting. And uh, Isaiah saw what was happening around them as God's response to that. And Jesus looks at this passage and he offers this and he, he ends up using this as a, uh, a vision for his ministry. And this is a vision of justice. And Jesus has this expectation that Christians are going to work for justice. Interestingly, you would think that Christians would be agreed. Yes, we are all for justice. And yet, this is actually one of the more controversial issues that churches face today. Are we for justice, and what kind of justice are we for? And we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Just this past week, I was listening to a podcast, and it, it was an interview with a person who is both a, a lawyer and a theologian. And he's done a lot of work on, on this topic. And he was commenting about um, the conservative and liberal views of justice. And when I say conservative and liberal, I don't mean the political parties. I mean uh, more the, the, the wings of, of, uh, of uh, theological uh, perspective. And he acknowledged that both of them were pro-justice, but had very different visions for what justice was supposed to be. And so he said the conservative Uh, Christians are all for justice. And by justice, what they mean is a a strong hand on crime to uh, increase increase, uh, arrests of criminals and also to increase the death penalty. This was in an American context. And they believe that if we can take a stronger stand against crime, increase the punishments, make it much more harsh against criminals, uh, then that is a stand for justice. Whereas the liberal Christians were saying, yes, we are for justice. And what we mean by that is we want to make sure that poor people have what they need to live, that people have access to medical care, uh, people have access to food, to education, that there are opportunities for people to to, uh, be able to improve their life in different ways and all of these other things. And these two groups would look at each other and say, you're doing justice in the wrong way. And this kind of conflict has been going on for a long time. Uh, I remember uh, back when I was in my early 20s at the church I was attending, we were watching a documentary, and it was on the church in Latin America. And they were talking about how different churches were working for justice in that situation where you have government and rebels fighting each other, and leaving the, the villagers and, uh, and the, the average people in a very difficult place where the poor are suffering beyond what we could possibly imagine here in Canada. And certain churches were working hard for justice for the poor in these communities. And they had an interview with one pastor who said, I, I reject the efforts of these churches. What they're doing is wrong. And he said, what we are supposed to be doing is getting people into heaven and not to do these other things. Uh, That we are are not to be looking to feed people or to improve life or anything else. We simply get people into heaven and that is it. And anything else is a distraction. And I have encountered that many times since then where uh, people have said the purpose of the church is simply evangelism. We are to tell people about Jesus, and if we can get them on the right track to go to heaven, then we have done our job, and it's time for us to move on to the next person. Well, one of my 
um, heroes of the faith uh, when it comes to church history is John Wesley. And John Wesley was one of the greatest evangelists uh, in the Christian church. And I appreciate him so much. He was very effective as an evangelist, did a lot of open air evangelism, and uh, uh, wasn't always popular with, uh, with some people over that. But one of the things that I, I came across is John Wesley's manifesto. And these are 12 things that were very, very important to John Wesley. And I can give you the references to the sermons that these are taken from if you want. But I'm just going to read the, uh, the 12 parts of John Wesley's manifesto. One, reduce the gap between rich people and poor people. Two, help everyone to have a job. Three, help the poorest, including introducing a living wage. Four, offer the best possible education. Five, help everyone to feel they can make a difference. Six, promote tolerance. Seven, promote equal treatment for women. Eight, create a society based on values and not on profits and consumerism. Nine, end all forms of slavery. Ten, avoid getting into wars. Eleven, share the love of God with everyone. Twelve, care for the environment. I don't think that fighting for justice is a, uh, is a distraction from evangelists. I actually find that many, especially young people today, are very interested in justice. They really have this sense of right and wrong that they're, what they see are around the world, uh, the things that are happening even in our own communities, it's not right. And they want, they want to fight for that. And some people have had some very good success to demonstrate that, you know what, that feeling is consistent with the teachings of Jesus. And churches have partnered with such young people, and it actually has ended up being a means of evangelism while they are are working towards the common goal of justice. One of the other concerns that some people have had is how does this fit with our belief that Jesus is going to return? Uh, Again, at a different church that I attended, uh, this kind of fight for justice It was compared to rearranging chairs on the Titanic. That's the way they looked at this kind of thing. If the Titanic is sinking, what's the point of moving those chairs around to a nicer uh, nicer pattern? And they would say, if Jesus is coming back, who cares about this world? Who cares if there's injustice in this world? Who cares if if these bad things are happening and and the the gap between the poor and the rich is getting wider and that there's all of this injustice? Who really cares? Because Jesus is coming back. And yet people have been saying that for 2,000 years. And if we're going to compare it to the Titanic, it's as if, what if the Titanic hadn't hit that iceberg? What if the Titanic had 100 years worth 